during that five months that every day she was bringing you food, if she shows up, oh, what, what runs through your mind? What, well, talking you know, to her. You know, the moment yes. you come back to her at home, now she, you are, she's coming to you in the prison. That's an, a very interesting and profound question because w we both, you know, as we recall that period, you know, we, we both recognize that neither of us had a sort of negative sense of what was going on. Frankly, we say that it actually put us on a spiritual high because we were both in that period full of praise to God, full of thanksgiving just day by day to what we were seeing in terms of, you know, I, I'm asthmatic, so I mean, being in a prison cell with all the dampness and so on and so forth and being able to survive from day to day, that's a miracle enough, you know. So, so we, we both um, always had the sense that, you know, God was in control, God is watching. And, and as she likes to emphasize to people, when she said God is watching, she wasn't just saying God is watching the other people, but God is watching us as well. If we have done some wrong things that we're trying to bury under the carpet or whatever, um, you know, God will expose it. I mean, that was the meaning for her of that statement. So I, I think we both had, you know, a very powerful sense, you know, of, of God's presence with us through that whole period. And it, it made us unmoved, you know, by all the maneuvers and all the intrigues. You know, we were, frankly, dealing with very powerful people, very powerful forces. We had very little, I mean, um, by way of uh, the ability to contest all that. I mean, you interacted with young people then in the prison and even out of prison and you still interact with young people now. You've seen now the growing demand for accountability on the part of the people mm -hmm. so that the political class now must live by what they say and do what they said they will do. Absolutely. It's a very interesting analogy that uh, you have made because what is being demanded by a lot of young people is no different from what young people in the 70s, for instance, were demanding of, at that time, they were military leaders. But young people in the universities, they were coming out on demonstrations, pointing out that the state of the country is not what it should be. Things have to change. And part of what young people today, for instance, are saying is that it's not enough for you to paint for us a nice glossy picture of things that you say you are doing. The economy is great, everything is good. Because the experience that they have on the ground as young people, you know, when they graduate from university, they don't have a job. When, you know, they, they, they look at what is happening with a few of, you know, their peers even who may have gone into a political life, they see that some of those people have become very rich very quickly with no real source of income <laughs> you know that is legitimate and so young people are seeing some of these things directly so they are not going to be taken in by the glossy accounts of everything being rosy everything being perfect because they experience the truth that's right they, you know, they, 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 they experience it in their day-to-day -day existence. And, and as I say, this has always been the spirit of young people. So the fix the country we are seeing now is just a reflection of those agitations in the 70s, Absolutely. The same. 80s. I think it's the, same, it's the same kind of mood where people from their experience want a difference. They want a change of what is happening. And, you know, one of the things that I, I remember um, in the 70s, because I, I, had, I had an apartment on Legon campus, so I was right in the middle of a lot of what's going on. 
So, you know, sometimes the police would be sent onto campus to try to quieten all this agitation. You know, the police were sent to Black Star Square the other yes. day, you know, I hear with hot water and so on. And you know, in fact, on one occasion, as, as uh, I, I recall, the police actually invaded my, my apartment, but fortunately I was not there. I was, I was in my office at a law faculty. I may not have been alive by now. But, wow. you know, in spite of all the efforts to suppress these agitations, they continued, and they, they continue not because anybody is instigating them. In those days, mm -hmm. sometimes I got accused of instigating, instigating students. I had no power to instigate students to do a lot of the things they did, bravely and boldly taking on, you know, a military regime. But they wanted a different nation. Mm -hmm. They were craving for a different nation. And that craving ran through the whole June 4th period to June 4th, 79, through to December 31st, 81. Students in 82 were prepared to have the university shut down so that they go and cut cocoa from the hinterland for exports. Because Ghana's whole cocoa industry had broken down we were not earning much from exports. Mm -hmm. So students who normally, their core business was to learn. is to learn. Yes. They thought that the nation was at a, 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 a crossroads where they should set aside what was their core business, go and help haul cocoa. And of course, that was part of what the leadership of Jerry Rawlings also achieved for this country. That Around him, people had a conviction of, you know, a leadership that was determined to make a change, to make a difference for the country. And, and to make a difference that had nothing to do with personal, you know, sort of um, wealth or personal power, but had everything to do with the nation's future. You know, so, so I... I don't think anybody should really be surprised by um, this movement of young people. But I also dare say that, you know, if people think it can be suppressed by the use of force and so on, I think history teaches us better. And we, we, the response has been what you're talking about, the suppression and now you also have you know, court action restraining them from from hitting the streets because of COVID protocol, which we have seen the blatant disregard of by the, the political class. I mean, what what is, in your view, with the hindsight of history, the, what will be the result of an attempt to suppress the expression of frustration of the youth, as we're seeing you now? Know, I, I'm struck by a few things, just observing um, some of the recent happenings. I'm, I'm struck by a few things. You know, when the first demonstration was stopped by this court action, you know what the young people did? Immediately, they took to social media. Social media. That's right in order to express themselves. Yeah. And social media is a very powerful tool these days. We've seen how the Arab Spring and so on, That's right. you know, was really orchestrated in part by people sharing stories exactly. across social media and so on and so forth. Even in those earlier days when social media may not have been as powerful a force as they are today. So my simple observation is that even that process of trying to stop them actually galvanized the movement. That's right. Now, I read recently that the Supreme Court had uh, set aside the High Court's uh, uh, decision, decision 
But then the very next day, the police are back in court trying to, you know, exactly. um, uh, claim uh, uh, another decision mm -hmm. to stop the process. As I said, it's difficult to stop these processes just by, you know, this kind of negative reaction mm -hmm. um, to try to ban the expression that people are giving to their frustrations and their sense of things not being wrong, uh, not not being done right, things going wrong. So, I think the answer should be to heed the call to fix the country. Heed the call to fix the country. Yes, because heeding that call would enable you to demonstrate that you are responding in a constructive way. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, some of the things that are being, I mean, attention is being drawn to, I mean, are not mysteries to us. Absolutely. I mean, the issues about corruption, you know, the issues we hear about day and night. A young person um, is shown uh, in the media flaunting, you know, thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. because he happens to be close to a certain position of power or young people who have um, occupied a certain position for barely three or four years. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, a lot of houses, real estate, you know. Um, I mean, you see, if these things happen, people will get to know about Absolutely. them. And, and these are the things that, you know, infuriate uh, young people. Now, I'm not saying young people themselves don't have issues that they need to address in part of, in, in the sense of what their contribution should be. I mean, I think, you know, some young people have also deviated from the straight and narrow and, you know, they are part of the in corrupt fact, some system. Some people actually have a question whether the young people in politics now give us an assurance of how the future will be. Well, you know... In the kind of politics yes, that we... I, I hear some of that skepticism, but I'll tell you what. I still have a lot of confidence in young people uh, for, for two reasons. You see, those examples of individuals who go astray and so on, I think the reason why we see some of those individuals, you know, going the way that they go is because some of them see themselves just in terms of their individual, you know, power position, which they think they've acquired because, you know, they did work for the party, for the party to come to power, so they deserve some to, reward, yeah. you know, be compensated and so on. And so they're doing it as individuals. But I think what we are seeing currently is about young people as a movement That's right. and that are going to say, look, as a movement trying to fix the country, we should check each other's, you know, role, each other's responsibility. Each, That's right. We should hold each other accountable. That's what I'm hearing from, from from this movement that, that is growing in the country. And that's what gives me a lot of uh, comfort. But the second reason why I still have a lot of confidence in young people is really a simple biological reason. You know, when I was in Legon, in the days that I was describing to you, when, yeah. when, when um, in the 70s, I, I was barely in my 20s. Part of my eagerness, part of my urgency about things changing was because when I looked at the fact that I have many more years that I can anticipate to be alive ahead of me. Some of the people in leadership, you know, they're pretty old and they have fewer years, so they have less at stake, you know, than what I have. So. For me, when I look at young people today, I know that part of their sense of urgency is because they have many decades ahead of them where if things continue to go downhill, they have a lot to lose. 
So they'd better stop the tide of decline and ensure that things change, things get fixed, so that those decades ahead are more comfortable for them than they would have been. So from a sheer biological perspective, I think young people just have so much at stake that they cannot afford to let you know, the rot continue. You know? and, and I think that is what gives a sense of urgency. And that is what also gives me a certain hopefulness that they will indeed you know, be not just persistent, but they will also be insistent on holding each other accountable, such that this movement really leads to a reversal of direction of the country. It enables the country to move forward. And, and, and that's why I explained that when I go back to the 70s and how things crystallized around, in that context, it, it was around Jerry Rawlings, but I mean, you know, times are different now. So, you know, he, there, there will be other people and, and they don't have to be military people. They, they, in fact, these are all young civilians, you know. And so, so, so what gives me a certain hopeful outlook about what's happening now is not just that the young people are persistent in their call on leaders to fix the country, but I believe they're also insistent on themselves being accountable for the future. In other words, they, they are looking to build a new future in which they have a stake in. They, they, they have a, a large stake in it. They, they, they have young children, you know, who are also going to grow into that future. So they, they, they have a vision that they are trying to construct of the country. And I think that with the combination of their own accountability to each other and to themselves as a movement for, for what the state of the country is going to be. And, and, and with their determined drive to have the things that need to be fixed, fixed, I think it gives hope for, for, for the future. And as for judicial decisions here and there, I mean, in, in, in the time of the military in Achampong's time, as, as I have mentioned in the past. People were jailed, you know, preventive custody was used to keep people like, um, you know, William Oferiata and so on, uh, away from having any political influence. But, you know... In, in the letter, really, have you ever noticed, at a point, you were William Oferiata's lawyer. Yes, I was. You were William Oferiata's lawyer at a point. I was junior lawyer to Mr. Joe Reindorf. <laughs> yes, for Mr. William Operator. Yes. <laughs> it's just for the records. <laughs> it's just for the records. But, I mean, the Director of Principles of State Policy, and I keep re making reference to it, of our 1992 Constitution, it dictates that the most secure democracy is that which is able to meet the basic needs of its people. And it's clear that, I mean, with what is going on, a lot more questions about if our democracy is actually meeting the basic needs of the people who are being governed right. by this democracy. Right, and those questions are being asked in very real, basic terms. Mm -hmm. They're being asked, you know, because people are experiencing living conditions. Of course, we know that last year, COVID-19, there was a, a hit on the country and so on. So when young people see situations like that, I think that we should all applaud that our attention is being drawn to things. This is a public health emergency, COVID-19, public health emergency worldwide. And for some people, it becomes an opportunity just to make money, you know, whether through the testing system at the airport or yeah. through uh, vaccines being imported and so on. That is something very serious that needs to be addressed. I mean, and I believe that, you know, they're actually doing the president a lot of good in 
highlighting some of these issues and, and ensuring that, you know, these issues should be sort of at the forefront of the concerns of, of our leaders. When, when people bring up, you know, issues about corruption, um, I think they're doing us all a favor and, and, and we should get to the bottom of, of those issues. We shouldn't just brush it aside and say, well, you know, once upon a time somebody said corruption has been there since Adam's days and so on. Well, but, you know, Adam has put us all in a lot of trouble, <laughs> you know, since, uh, since the original sin. And, and we, we, we must avoid being corrupted. We, we must stand against the sin that, um, you know, pollutes our whole environment. Because as, as people calculate, um, you know, corruption costs our country a whole lot. So when day after day, you know, you come upon instances in which national resources are just being squandered through corrupt practice, I think that is what sh should, should be of great concern to, to leaders. Over time, has there been a clear exhibition of the political will beyond the, the verbal commitment to fight corruption, you know, in your view? Once upon a time, we heard that um, the setting up of the office of the special prosecutor was a demonstration of, of commitment the of, commitment of this administration to fight, to fight corruption. corruption. And we saw a special prosecutor being appointed who was seen as a citizen vigilante, mm -hmm. you know, who would address the issues. Now, how did that special prosecutor end up? He ended up actually referring to his appointing authority, the president, as the mother serpent of corruption. That's a really serious allegation. When an auditor general, who is supposed to be an independent, you know, public servant with a major responsibility for addressing issues of corruption in the public service. When he gets hunted down in the way that the past Auditor General was hunted down from office and unable to perform his role, sent on leave and so on. Oh, I don't think that, I don't, well, well, you know, even before that he'd been sent on leave and so exactly. on, and then in the end they said his time was due and there were issues about his date of birth and so on and so on. But the, the signal that, that, that all of that sends, including to people who are supporters yeah. of this government, the signal that that sends out is not such a good signal. I mean, I have seen and heard uh, people who were fervent advocates uh, of the president um, express their concern in relation to some of these uh, issues. And you see, we, we've, we've got to recognize that, you know, I mean, the citizenry as a whole lives very close to all these events and activities in the sense that people live next door to ministers, to aides to the president, to you know, uh, political appointees. Pointy, People yes. live next door to them in, in communities, and they observe them. They observe, you know, how they splash money and how they behave, um, you know, uh, when they are in public. And you know, uh, before we conclude, you, you have a special relationship with with the with the late president. Jerry John Rawlings, and um, you referred to him a few times in the previous instances, and and how the young people, for instance, through the reflection of a commitment of the leader, he was able to galvanize support. Beyond your relationship, how would you describe his contribution to the democratic development of this country, Ghana? You know, 
first and foremost, what comes to my mind is the fact that even though he started off coming into power from a military, you know, coup, right from the onset, the mission that he set himself was a mission of restoration of the country. A mission that was desperately needed at that time because the country had really, you know, fallen to its lowest levels in the late 70s and early 80s. And was his sense of mission from the start. I think the second point I want to emphasize, you know, and, and I think people underrate this. The second aspect of his mission that I saw and heard from him was this importance for him of economic justice. Economic justice. You know, he was very passionate about the fact that whilst farmers are producing the wealth of this country, cocoa farmers are the basis on which things are being exported and so on. If you looked at their conditions of life, there were nothing to write home about. Meanwhile, the people in you know, positions in Cocoa Board and so on and so forth, you know, are living off the world that is free. So he had a very striking sense of the importance of economic justice uh, within a country like ours. And I think thirdly, and related to that, he was also very concerned about how the political system as a whole will reflect what he always referred to as a true democracy. You know, one of the most important things that I also realized about President Rawlings was that he was eager to work with people from different political factions. In other words, you had, you know, former President Kufo as one of the early PNDC yes. secretaries. That's right. You had Alaji Mahama Idrisu as, you know, a PNDC secretary. They were from a different political orientation, perhaps from some of the younger people, you know, Chris Atim and so on, mm -hmm. who were part of that period, you know. And you know, he sought to bring together forces that might be regarded as polarized. And I thought that was quite interesting. So in fact, when the NDC came out of the PNDC, you will notice that the NDC had people from different political traditions right. all featuring. And that's why I think it was called a Congress as opposed to a party. So. I, I think those are important elements of what, you know, President Rowling's mission for the country was. And I think that any objective assessment would have to give him credit for much of what he achieved. I mean, I think some of the people who used to refuse him credit ended up getting closer to him later in life and giving him some of the deserved credit. But I'm sure that history will judge him kindly. And you know, at a point, you were his lawyer at a point as well. Yeah, I was his lawyer when he was on trial. Um, when he was on trial before a military tribunal, he was on trial and um, that could have led to his being executed um, if he was convicted. But as I, as I always point out, mm -hmm. uh, the young soldiers were better lawyers than I am because they actually rescued him from jail. <laughs> I see. That's after 79. 79, that's correct. How old were you then? I was 28. 28. June 4th, I was 28 then. 28 years. Yeah. The following October, I was 29. But by June 4th, I was, uh, I was 28. And, and um, I was not scared to go into the military tribunal and all that. You see, because of what I said at the beginning, that in those days, what was urgent to me as a young person 
was that this country was not at a good place and there was a need for things to change. The country needed to be fixed. And so I was quite fearless in being willing to represent somebody like that on trial right in the heart of Burma camp. And I, I should tell you a, a story about that. I, I hesitate because I, I, I wonder whether it will be misused against me someday, but I'll tell you the story. You know, the weekend before June 4th, that weekend, a friend of mine was getting married and his wedding was actually at the officer's mess, uh, the Air Force officer's mess. And I was coming from Legon to this wedding. And when I got to 37, my car had a problem. So I parked the car somewhere and I jumped in a taxi and I went with this taxi and got off at the officer's mess. The taxi driver was having difficulty in finding change when I gave him money. So a young man just walks across to the car, the taxi, and finds out that the taxi driver is having difficulty getting change for me. So he asks what the fare was. So he pays the taxi driver and he says to me, don't worry, your man will be out soon. That's what a young man... This was after the trial had started. Jay Rawlings was in jail. Yeah. And this young man, he had never met me obviously before. He was clearly another rank in the military. He just tells me after he's paid my taxi That's fare, right. don't worry, your, your man, man will be, be out soon. soon. I mean, you know, I didn't know what to make of it, but um, a few days later, June 4th happened. And Jay Rollins was rescued. And Jay Rollins was out. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I didn't have any control over what happened on June 4th. I was just in the midst of it. I was a lawyer representing him. But there were forces happening around me which were beyond me, you know. And um, I, I, I pray to God that, um, you know, we are all kind of sensitive to the things happening around us. You have had the benefit of being at the forefront mm -hmm. of these two election petitions um, in this country in 2013 and in 2020. I'm going to refer to the just ended election mm -hmm. petition 2020 case where this time in the reverse you were the lead counsel for the petitioner mm -hmm. at the time in 2013 you were the lead counsel for the third respondent, the third respondent at the uh, yeah. time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I mean after this 2020 petition you, you, you have described the ruling as, as a dangerous precedent for, 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 for us. Why is that I, the case? I have, and um, I have done that, you know, in, 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 with all seriousness. I've done that with all seriousness. Because when I observed the proceedings in this past petition, and I look at the issues that were at stake, particularly issues about holding the chairperson of the Electoral Commission to account for her role as a returning officer in the presidential election. When I look at the decisions that were made in respect of that, I have to be concerned. We start off with a situation where the chairperson had indicated by virtue of witness statements that she herself signed 
before the court that she would be a witness for the Electoral Commission. She actually signed the statement verifying the, the um, response of the Electoral Commission uh, to the petition. She signed it. Then she goes on to sign a witness statement where she says, these are the facts, you know, she's, and she, and the, the witness statement is on oath, you know, and she affirms certain facts. So, notice had been served that she would testify about the things that she knew. And you have to set that against the fact that we called two witnesses, Dr. Kpesa White and Mr. Metal Nunu, who gave an account of what they experienced as far as her role was concerned that day before she made the pronouncement. They gave an account. Nobody has really contested that account. The witness statement is on record. Then when it comes actually to giving the testimony, she says, I'm no longer going to go into the witness box. Because the nature of this particular petition, and this particular petition was different from the 2013 one, the 2012, 2013 one, because this petition centered around her declaration, what she declared, which we all heard. That's what this petition centered. It wasn't about, you know, uh, everything that happened at every polling station around so is the that country. that's why you didn't go 11, to court with the pink Exactly, sheets? exactly. This, this petition didn't have to do with 11,000 so many uh, polling stations as was claimed in 2013. Of course, in the end, it was shown when there was an audit that there weren't 11,000 polling stations. It was more like 8,000. So that itself was not true. But this petition was all about her declaration and the constitutionality of the declaration in terms of meeting the constitutional criteria. So, so if in her own figures something had gone wrong, only she could explain. Now, what was being used to try to correct error were unsigned press releases from the Electoral Commission, unsigned, no authentication, and somehow those were being used to correct errors, made an, an official declaration. Now, that you can't do legally. I mean, legally, the person who has authority to make the declaration is the person who has to correct their own errors. And in this case, we did not have... You see, it would have been one thing if the chairperson or the electoral commissioner said, OK, we did make errors. We are now setting aside that document which contain all the errors. Right. The chairperson is now going to make a new declaration. And then you proceed in accordance with the procedures to make that new declaration. It would have been one thing if that had been the process, but that was not the process. Here, the so-called corrections were not emanating from the rightful source. And that rightful source says, I'm not going to give any evidence. So on what basis can a court of law say that we are satisfied that there have been errors done by that person who didn't come to testify, there's no documentation from her. Even the so-called corrections, as we all know, themselves had to be corrected later. You know, so so you, you, you have the... Um the respondents, and in this case, the first respondent and the second respondent's lawyer saying that. You go to court with the strength of your case. Absolutely. And not the weakness of the respondent. Absolutely. The strength of our case was that the chairperson acted in error in her declaration, and she acknowledged in the court that there was error in that declaration. Everybody had no doubt that there was error. So the question is, how is the error to be corrected? So our case was proven by 
I mean, we, we had a tape, we, we showed the video of her making the declaration. And everybody knows that what she said in that declaration was an error. So we proved our case. There's nothing more to prove. If, if having done that, that first respondent says, yes, I made an error. I would like to be given an opportunity to correct that error by the court. That's a proper process to go through. You don't say that I made an error and some unsigned press release corrected it for me. Meanwhile, that unsigned press release itself, the figures in that unsigned press release are not what you come to court to defend with. Because the figures that you come to defend with are themselves different from your correction. So, you know, there are about four different permutations. I, I, I think sometimes we can make all these things look too legalistic. Let me just simplify it from the point of view of that chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Mrs. Jean Mensah, just as an individual. And she's a Christian, you know, we see her, you know, in fact, in the, in the declaration that she made, she was giving glory to God and so on and so forth. So just in terms of personal responsibility, what I'm saying is, if she has told the country something in a declaration which she now realizes she made a mistake in, just in human terms, what do you do when you make a mistake? Especially when you have such an important national role. You acknowledge the error in the same public way in which you made the error, and you then seek the opportunity to make a correction. That's, that's a normal human process, and that's actually what the legal process also provides in the Constitution, that if somebody who is in a certain position, you know, to uh, make a declaration of who is president, if that person says, the declaration that I made on December 9th, I have realized that it contained errors and I would like an opportunity to correct it. The law allows that person indeed to correct it, but that correction is not done by a press release issued by uh, a press officer who later gets uh, an appointment as an ambassador. You know, I mean, that's not what the law provides. The next step was where we said, well, yes, there are parties, but under the laws of Ghana, the statute, the evidence law, says in black and white that where a party has made certain representations to the other party about the case that they are presenting in court, as the chairperson had done by signing, you know, to say that she's going to testify this and that, where that has happened, there is what is called an estoppel. She is precluded from not, you know, now coming to testify because she's sworn on oath that she's going to come and testify to this and that. So we said she's a stop. And that's when we made an application that based on this rule of evidence, she cannot just refuse to come and testify because she's a stop. Now, that was also rejected. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, you know, when it was being rejected, as you recall, the Chief Justice's ruling was based on Black's Law Dictionary, a law dictionary in England, mm -hmm. which was not applying that particular rule in the statutes that we have in Ghana. So we went on a review application and we said, but Black's Law Dictionary does not cover the situation that is covered in our statute. We have an actual piece of legislation which says this. So whatever happens in England, according to common law or their right. statute, is different. So we went on review. Again, that was rejected. Then we took it a step further. We said, okay, they are not going to call the chairperson as a witness. But we can subpoena her. We have a right to subpoena 
under the rules of Which court. Which you try to trigger. Yes, mm -hmm. we have a right to subpoena, huh? but we had closed our case by that time because, you know, we have yes. to close our case for them to open their case. So we said, since she's now changed her mind, we are also now asking permission to reopen our case, case so that we, she will come in as a witness. And you know, and when, that's allowed in when, law. When, of course it's allowed in law, you know, order 38 or whatever it is, uh, which provides for subpoenas and so on. It's allowed in court. And it's actually a risk because if you do that and the witness comes, she can testify to things which can go against you. But we were willing to take that risk of a subpoena on the chairperson because a lot of what had been testified to by Mr. Metal Nunu, uh, Dr. Pesa White, we knew could not be contested. In fact, those witnesses were really confirmed in some aspects of their testimony by a videotape from an interview that Mark Menu, you know, who was representing uh, the, the, the president mm. in court, had done with Metro TV or something. I mean... But the panel of judges thought so, otherwise. Yes, yes. The so, ruling so, 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 described so, the witnesses, I mean, the account of fanciful. those two that you brought in court yes. as fanciful. Yeah. What was the justification given for that? What aspect of the testimony that they gave was fanciful. They testified about what they experienced, what they saw and heard in the strong room and in the secretariat of um, the chairperson. What was fanciful about that? In fact, that statement in the judgment of the court is quite extraordinary because it is backed by nothing in terms of the record of proceedings. They didn't even try to say it is fanciful or we don't believe it because of this fact and this fact and this fact. You know, when you say somebody is giving evidence that is fanciful, you're trying to show that it does not reflect the actual facts. So you must be able to point us to the facts which make it fanciful. Do you read in the judgment any determination of facts which make that fanciful? There's nothing like that. In the, so, so the point is that at the time when we were seeking to reopen our case to issue the subpoena, we were actually taking a risk because our witnesses had testified, we were satisfied with their witness, and there was a danger that this witness that we're now calling could actually come and contradict some of the things that, you know, that witness. But we were prepared to take that risk because we believe that if the chairperson, being you know a Christian and talking about to the glory of God, really wanted to glorify God, she would come and speak the truth. And we knew that that truth would set us all free. So we were prepared to take the, the, the chance. But that opportunity was also denied us, not just by herself, but by the judges. Because the judges said, we cannot reopen our case. Now, I mean, yes, it's a matter of discretion whether a court allows a party to reopen their case. But in this particular situation, the reason we were having to reopen our case because, was because she had represented to everybody that she would be testifying on behalf of the Electoral Commission. And so at that point, we couldn't have subpoenaed her to testify for us because she had you know, mm -hmm. sworn on oath that she was coming to testify. So we couldn't uh, subpoena her. But she had now changed her mind. So, based on that, we were surely entitled also to change our mind and to say, well, we closed our case on this basis. So give us a chance now to reopen our case and to use the normal court process to subpoena her. We were not allowed to reopen our case There's one, there's one statement I want to put to you. So <laughs> one of the uh, panel members who was spoken after this ruling has indicated that you, you don't come to court with spreadsheets. You come to court with, with pink sheets to show <laughs> as yes. evidence, to justify your case. You know, 
uh, well, your case I'm sorry to say, yes. if she really believes uh, that we were we were not doing what was required in the case, then I'm sorry to say she misunderstood the nature of the case that we presented. Because the nature of the case that we presented was about the declaration that was erroneously made by and unconstitutionally made by the chairperson of the Electoral Commission. And if you use her own figures, as we demonstrated, if you use her own figures and you do the tally, there wasn't a crossing of the 50% threshold. That is just a fact. Now, those facts were in effect admitted. They were admitted because everybody acknowledged that there had been an error, there had been an error in the declaration that was made. Now, I know that um, I think it's Justice Tokonu who is reported to have made some of these remarks. She also said we should have uh, uh, shown that there was padding or whatever. Yes, you demonstrate beyond reasonable doubt <laughs> that know, indeed the, what the, you are saying is The actually... representative of Nana Akufuadu in the court, you know, one of the respondents, I think the second respondent, his representative, Mark Menu, himself, did, an, again, another press interview in which he said there was padding in favor of both Mahama and Nana Akupadu. So, I mean, when you have your opponents actually admit what you are so seeking to prove, I mean, what more evidence do you need? And, you know, I think that what is important about this second petition in terms of, you know, the legal uh, position that it put forward and, and, and what in the end the court decided. What is important is that it was a completely different petition from what was before the 2013 panel. And in this petition, it was about the unconstitutional conduct of the chairperson of the Electoral Commission. It wasn't about counting, you know, how many polling stations there had been this infringement or that infringement, and it was about none of those things. In 2013, Dr. Baumia tried to give the impression that there were infringements at 11,000 and something, something uh, polling stations, and they categorized them into 24 headings, you know, this uh, category of infringement, this category of infringement. That's not what this petition was about. This petition was square and simply at the door of the chairperson of the Electoral Commission and her exercise of her responsibility as returning officer. That's what it was. And the heart of the case about her error in her declaration was actually admitted on all sides. So what, what does a judge, you know, after the event uh, um, mean by trying to tell us how we should have presented our case? We presented our case the way we thought was legally and constitutionally appropriate. Right on the altar of the chairperson, the constitutionally mandated you know, institution to declare a result. We place it right at her feet, right on the altar of her responsibility to declare only in accordance with a certain, you know, sort of set of figures, 50% plus. But if you look at her figures and you actually see that what she declared is an error, as she, in, you know, in the end ad admitted, then how does anybody say that mm -hmm. We needed pink sheets in order to prove what has been admitted by the uh, uh, chairperson herself. I, I don't understand that, and, and I think it's unfortunate. I think people are trying to make excuses for clearly wrong decisions that have been taken. And, and I think one you know, final comment that I would make, you know, when I look at what ha happened in this case as against 2013, 
I have to say that in 2013, you had, you know, each of the judges on a number of the important points articulating their reasons for taking this side or that side. Because, you know, on many of the issues, decisions were given, you know, six against three, five against four in some cases. So each of the judges had a chance to articulate That's their right. reasons and to explain their point of view from a, a legal, you know, yeah. uh, authority standpoint. In this uh, last petition, I think as we also virtually in all the decisions, the chief judge will write an opinion and everybody was on board. I think that's an important that and unfortunate signal. Hmm. You know, before the election petition uh, was actually filed by uh, John Mahama, you know, there were a lot of people in the NDC who were saying, don't bother, you know, all the Somewhere. judges were appointed by, you know, either President Kufo or President Akufado. So don't bother. There are a lot of people saying that. Absolutely. And you see, for me, it would be unfortunate if all that comes out from the observations that are made of the court process is that, oh, so those people were right. It's unfortunate because, in fact, I would have like the situation and and seriously for me it wasn't so much the outcome a decision in favor of this or that person that was important but in a sense the integrity of the process and the credibility of the process so that people have continued faith in the process you know uh, maybe john mahama is actually quite relieved that he doesn't have to be president amidst all the difficulties <laughs> of, of uh, our, our situation. Um, so it's not the outcome that I'm bothered about. I, I'm just saying that whatever the outcome, it should be something that has credibility for all of us. You know, at the end of the 2013 petition, what I said when I was interviewed really reflects my feeling, my, my deepest emotion. That is, it, it's a victory for the unity of the country. The unity of the country. That, that is what has been sustained. Because ultimately, with all the toing and froing, the judges taking different positions on different things, and in the end, on many of the things, only a 5-4 decision and so on and so forth. In the end, the process was such that People could say, look, this was a process, but in the end, the outcome was this, so let's move on. With a situation like we just had, I'm not sure that people see it quite in those terms, especially when you look at the conduct of the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, because then people say, oh, so if that person is going to be still chairperson for the next election, what do you think is going to happen? And those are the sort of things that can stir up disunity and can stir up, you know, unfortunate things for our country. And, 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 and I, I, I feel, you know, I, I make no bones about this. I, I feel that all of us, uh, you know, have a responsibility to reflect on these things and come to determinations. I, I come to a clear determination that there were errors made in the decisions and, and I, I make no bones about you know saying so and, and respectfully explaining why I say so in, 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 in the manner that I think I've il illustrated in this discussion. It's not out of disrespect to the judges or you know trying to um, you know make fun of them or so. No, I mean it is out of a sense for me of the importance of their role and the importance of their fidelity to the constitution and to the law. That, for me, is what makes it essential that if I see something going astray, 
I try to speak up, speak up for, about it and, and, and speak up for the right thing to be done. There is always so much that you leave us with and I am so grateful for your commitment not only to redirect the focus of the nation to the important issues but also to use your experience to encourage people to always look at the brighter side of life. We thank you so much for making the time to sit with us. It's been over two and a half hours talking to you, sharing your life principles and experiences with us. And we don't take that for granted at all. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you very much. And, and I don't take these opportunities for granted either. Um, in fact, uh, I think you know, these opportunities are, are a blessing to me personally because they also enable me to, to share a little bit. And, and I hope that um, they are taken in that light. Right. Oh, yeah, Chikata. Appreciate your time as always. Thank you. And you, we want to wish you all the best. Thank you. Good health and everything good and perfect. Amen. God's blessings. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Lawyer Chachuchikata sharing with us the principles and then also lessons is gleaned from the experiences that, you know, a lot of you would deem as very bad and unfortunate, but he shared with us those lessons to help us all be able to chart the course of life and to reflect on some of the pertinent issues of our country and our democracy that we're practicing. My name is Alfred Okonsi, and bear in mind today is June 18th, 2021, 13 years on. And he has a lot to reflect on, a lot to be grateful for, and a lot to share. Stay tuned to 2 3 You have a good evening. <laughs>